to the second lecture in the machine learning course. So regarding some organizational details like when to do the exam, uh, we will discuss this at the end of this lecture. Uh, but now I just want to remind you briefly what we did um, last time. So we introduced the general structure of a neural network. It's composed of neurons that are connected to each other. And there's a bunch of neurons at the bottom of the neural network that are the input neurons. So you feed in your input values and then layer by layer you calculate the output values. And the way this is done is shown here just to remind you. So there are two steps in each piece of the calculation. There's a linear step and a nonlinear step. And so in the oopsie, in the linear step, you take all these neuron values in the lowest layer. You take a weighted superposition of these values that's shown here, and you feed it into a neuron in the upper layer. So that would be the value that is here called Z. But then, this is not enough. This wouldn't give you any powerful neural network. And so in addition, you just apply a nonlinear function uh, that's shown here. So you apply a nonlinear function called F to each of these values that you calculated previously by the linear operation. And that's it. And then you just proceed step by step, layer by layer, doing the same stuff, linear superposition, nonlinear function, linear superposition, nonlinear function. So then I introduced to you how we would do this in Python. I pointed out that um, the way you are operating in the linear step is actually essentially a matrix vector multiplication. And so in a programming language like Python that has nice uh, linear algebra capabilities, uh, you can literally apply a matrix to a vector in a single step and that would give you the output and then there's just this additional step of applying the nonlinear function. So we looked at how this would be done in Python. I also visualized what happens here. So if you have only uh, two input values, um, two input neurons and one output neuron, then you can plot these two input neurons um, in the two-dimensional plane and in the vertical axis you would have the output value. And here I only plotted the linear part, which obviously must be a plane. Yeah? If I have a function of two variables that is linear, that gives me a plane in such a representation. But then I will apply the nonlinear function and the nonlinear function can be any nonlinear function. But one famous example is the sigmoid, which basically cuts off all the values less that are smaller than zero and it also uh, suppresses the values that are larger than zero down to the level of one and it has a smooth transition between them. And so that is what is shown here. Okay. So that would be one step, still a relatively boring, uh, but then you can proceed layer by layer and you get the interesting behavior that we already observed last time. So there's one extra thing that I have to tell you how to make things efficient. And that is, in the end, we will be interested in not only calculating the output of the network for a single uh, input, but really for hundreds of inputs in parallel. And this can be done also using this linear algebra matrix vector notation very efficiently. And so this is what I want to talk about here. And so when we try to get the output of the network for 100 samples in parallel, we call these 100 samples together a batch. It's a batch of samples. It's just a set of samples that we want to apply the network to. So I've drawn the situation here. Um, you would have, say, a network with three input neurons. So each sample consists of three values. Um, and you want to feed many samples in parallel into the network without just doing a loop. Of course, you could always loop over all these samples and produce the corresponding output and then store the output, but you want to do it without a loop because at least in an interpreted language like Python, a loop would be terribly inefficient. And so uh, the way to do this is just to expand our arrays. 
So now all the arrays, I will go through the details, but all the arrays will acquire an extra index. This extra index counts the sample. So if we have 100 samples, then this extra index has values running from 0 to 99. And so this is shown here in some more detail. Uh, usually we would have one sample uh, that would be a vector of size n in, if n in is the number of input neurons of my network. So that is what we already discussed. But now if I have many samples that I want to process uh, in parallel, let's say n samples, this might be a number 100 or so, uh, then actually I will turn what had been a vector y, I will turn this into an array or a matrix yeah, with two dimensions. So first dimensions will be the number of samples, second dimension will be the uh, number of input neurons. And so now we can really use the tools that Python um, provides for linear algebra in order to do all these operations in parallel. Uh, one of the interesting things to notice here, if you want to make it work, is how Python interprets expressions where it, say, wants to add one matrix to a vector. So in principle, they don't have the same dimensions. So how does it make the dimensions match? It doesn't produce an error, but it actually does something smart. It makes the dimensions match in a smart way. So for example here, if you have A is a matrix, N1 times N2 matrix, B is only a vector, and the question is how does Python interpret this? And the answer is if B has the dimension N2, that here was the second dimension, then automatically uh, implicitly a first index for this B will be generated uh, but of course the result does not depend uh, the result in evaluating B does not depend on this first index yeah so uh, in index notation M would end up being a matrix M I J that is equal A I J element by element that's what you expect anyway uh, but then it would add to that uh, B J where you see only the second index J occurs yeah so automatically, um, you can write down such expressions that combine two different tensors of different dimensionality. And if the um, dimensions match in the right way, so this N2 is the same as that N2, uh, then Python will be able to handle it. So that will become important in the following when we write down these expressions. Because now uh, we can translate what we did for one sample to many samples. First I recall what we did for one sample. Um, in order to go from one layer to the next, we took the vector of neuron values, we multiplied by a matrix W that contains the weights, and then maybe we add some offset uh, B, and then what we get is another vector Z uh, that uh, produces uh, what happens in the next layer of neurons. So that was the elementary step, and then we still applied a nonlinear function. Yeah? So this was what we did step by step, layer by layer. And now we want to carry along this extra index that counts uh, the samples in the batch. And so we have to rearrange things a little bit to make it work. And so the solution is shown here. So actually the the line in the code doesn't actually change. It looks exactly the same. So you can make it such that it looks exactly the same, but you will automatically get this extra batch index for free. And the way to do it is to cleverly define uh, the, various, um, uh, the various arrays. Okay, maybe I promised too much. The line changes in one tiny but important aspect. So you see the order has been interchanged. Previously we had W comma Y, now we have Y comma W and I tell you uh, why that uh, is useful. So now I told you that um, y um, will no longer be just a vector of dimension n in, but it will be a matrix, n samples times n in, because we want to collect all these samples. Um, in order to properly multiply this with a weight matrix, you know that in matrix multiplication, the inner index in the product must always match. Yeah, This is the index that we sum over when we do multiplication of two matrices. So uh, automatically, the dimensions of this weight matrix now must be n in times n out. So somehow the indices have been interchanged from the old definition. But that's okay. Uh, in the end, we will not even care. 
because these weights we will never provide by hand. These weights will be automatically updated by the training, so, so that's fine. And so the result of this matrix-matrix multiplication now will be something of dimension n samples times n out. You see, I've written it down here, n samples times n out. And this is exactly what we needed. So we are carrying along this first index that now counts the samples in the batch. And uh, we have the proper dimension for this uh, vector of output neurons n out. Yeah. And then you still want to add this uh, constant um, offset b. And that also works out correctly according to the rule I just told you. Uh, so there's no problem there. So this is a little bit of trickery. Um, I just wanted to tell you how this is really implemented. And it's really important to be able to work on these batches of samples to work immediately on 100 samples in parallel. Okay. So maybe this is something to sit down at home and try out for concrete uh, arrays and check that this uh, syntax actually works. Okay. And so last time I already showed you what can come out of a network that has multiple layers, 20 hidden layers in this case, um, where the input I chose to be only two values uh, corresponding to the two coordinates in a two-dimensional plane, and the output was only one value that uh, was interpreted as a color value of a picture. And then if I choose just random weights in this network, uh, this is the kind of uh, picture that I can get. Yeah? So each of these pixels in the picture corresponded to one input to the network, corresponding of two coordinates, and it produced one output corresponding to the color of the pixel. And of course, if this is a 1,000 by 1,000 image, it has one million pixels, so it would be really, really inefficient to make a for loop that runs through all these one million pixels and always calculates the output of the neural network for each of the pixels. But if I have the smart way of uh, processing a whole batch, then I can really define a batch, in this case, of one million samples and do one operation that evaluates the network for all these one million samples in parallel. Okay, so that was a little bit technical detail, but if you try it out in Python, you will see that it works, and so that is just a way to be efficient. Okay, so now, this picture demonstrates to you that apparently neural networks can create very complicated looking functions, uh, because this picture looks complicated. And if I were to take a different set of random coefficients, it would look different, but structurally similar. But that's of course not what we want. We don't want to create <laughs> random functions. We want to create particular functions, namely those that we prescribe by the training data. For example, in the end, we want to say, um, oh, here it should all be red, and down here it must be blue, and then here there must be a yellow line. So we want to prescribe what should be the correct values, and we want to choose the weights so that they will produce such a picture. The question is how we do this. Okay. So um, it's best to understand what's going on. Or it's best to understand the power of neural networks if we restrict ourselves first to the one-dimensional case. So only one input neuron, one output neuron. So it's a mapping from one scalar value to another scalar value. In between, of course, I can have many neurons in the hidden layers, and I might need them, uh, but it's only a function of one variable. Okay. And it might look like the one shown here, so maybe that's the function I want to approximate using my neural network. And the question is, can I do this in general? Well, you know that one of the basic elements of my neural networks is this nonlinear step function, the smooth step function, the sigmoid. The question is, if I give you such a function, can you relate it somehow, at least approximately, to step functions? And the answer is, of course, yes. <laughs> uh, as you learned in your, well, undergraduate or even high school <laughs> education, for example, if you want to integrate a function, you might want to approximated by a piecewise constant function, and then that gives you a good approximation, at least for the purposes of the integral. How can we use a neural network to build such a piecewise constant function? Well, maybe we start small. We, <laughs> we take one step, 
and maybe this we can produce using a sigmoid function and then we will add other steps on top of this, like this. So um, what is important here is where the steps are located, so y1 and y2 are the positions of these steps. And also what is important is how high are these steps. So I call this delta F1 and delta F2. So these are the jumps in the value. Because if I know this, then I can already produce this simple function with two steps uh, by using my uh, sigmoid function, the F, the smooth step function. Because what I can do is the following. I can take F applied to something that contains the coordinate y, the input coordinate y, minus capital Y1. So this would now be a step function that no longer has the step at zero, at y equals zero, but obviously it's shifted, and the step will be at y equals capital Y1. Huh? So this, uh, this alone is a step function of step size one at the location Y1. And now I multiply by delta F1 to make sure that I get exactly the step height that I need. Huh? And then I would add to that a similar function that produces another step at y2 of height delta f2. Huh? And now you can imagine how this goes on. Yeah? Uh, so I will first try to approximate my smooth curve by a lot of little steps. I uh, find out where are these steps and how high are these steps. And then I can write down such a sum. And this sum is really what would happen in a neural network, yeah? So uh, for these two steps, if I just want to combine these two steps, um, here I would have the input neuron, y, a single value, and then I would uh, connect it to the two neurons of the hidden layer, um, where I do have a weight w, that's not so important, that only determines here the steepness of the slope, uh, plus I would have a bias uh, that is related to y1 and y2. So here I wrote down the two biases that I would need to pick. Yeah? Because remember, I in the linear superposition, there's not only the weights, but there's also this bias, this constant offset. And so by taking this together, uh, what we had called z uh, previously, that's the argument of the f function. And then I would try to add these two contributions simply by going another step to the output layer uh, and now the weights would be delta F1 and delta F2. This is what I need to multiply my smooth step functions with. And then I would just automatically add them up. This is what happens automatically here. Uh, and then I would choose not to have another nonlinear function at the output, yeah? Because uh, otherwise I would say take all of this result and still apply a nonlinear function. This is not what I want to have. This is already good enough. But I'm free to do this, yeah? So uh, here we only have a nonlinear function in the hidden layer. And now you can see I can just go on with this. I could just have more neurons in the hidden layer. And if I have 100 neurons in the hidden layer, I can make 100 steps. So that's good. So you see a simple neural network with one input neuron, one output neuron, and many hidden neurons can approximate actually arbitrarily well um, a smooth curve in one dimension. The question is how to do this in two dimensions and there are wa various ways of doing it. Uh, the simplest way is to try again to extend our concept of the step functions. So for, for example, what you can try and this is kind of a homework problem, um, you can try to generate in the plane a function that has this appearance. So it would be one in this full quarter plane to the upper right and zero everywhere else. And the question is, how do you do this? Yeah? And so I give you one construction that does this. Of course, it uses, um, it uses what we had previously, the step functions. And um, maybe I go, go back one step. Um, you know that if you have a step function along y1 and another step function along y2, and then if you somehow were able to multiply these step functions or produce an end operation so as to make the output equal to one only wherever both are one, uh, then that would be exactly in this blue area. Yeah? 
So if y1 is larger than some value and y2 is larger than some value, then you want the output to be 1. That would be the blue area. And so you can actually come up with a little trick to produce an AND function in a neural network. So let's assume that the inputs here are just 0 or 1, very simple, binary. And we want the output to be an approximation to the AND function. So that means you write a little truth table. If both inputs are 0, the output should be 0. If one of them is 1 but the other is still 0, the output is still 0. Only if both of the inputs are 1, then the output should be 1. Yeah? And again, this would be a little exercise to construct it, but I already gave the result here. Um, you would add, you would arrange the weights and biases such that essentially the output is f, our step function, of some weight w that only determines the steepness of the step function times y1 plus y2 minus 1.5. So that looks a little bit funny, but if you think about it, uh, only if both y1 and y2 are equal to 1, then their sum will be larger than 1.5. So even if you subtract 1.5, you still end up with something that is positive. And then the step function essentially gives 1. In all the other cases, you get something that is negative in the argument of the step function, and you get 0. And so you reproduce exactly the truth table that we wanted. Yeah? So you see how uh, with a simple concept of the neural network and such a simple step function, you can really produce something like the end. Okay. So let's call this the end. Uh, we keep in mind that there are choices for the weights and biases that will give us the end function. As a homework, you can try out more complicated functions like an OR or XOR function. That's actually a little bit more difficult. But for now, let's use the AND function uh, to get this two-dimensional step function. And so the, um, this is what we want to get in the plane if our inputs are y1 and y2, the two coordinates. And so what you can do is you produce a step in y1 and another step in y2 at a, at a suitable location. And then you just apply the end function that we just introduced. So you take the weights and biases that we just chose uh, to produce an end function. And so only if both conditions, so to speak, give one, if y1 is larger than y1 bar and y2 is larger than y2 bar, then finally y out will also be one. So you get exactly what you wanted. Yeah. And so you can play these games and try to uh, use this to approximate functions. And once you have these quarter space step functions, you can actually produce arbitrary functions. Yeah. So that was a little animation. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay, so um, there's actually a theorem that tells us you give me an arbitrary but maybe smooth function of arbitrarily many coordinates for input. That produces a vector valued output maybe, so not only one scalar value, but multiple values. And then uh, if I have a neural network with sufficiently many neurons in a single hidden layer, it's already able to approximate this arbitrarily well. If you want a better level of approximation, of course, you have to use more neurons in the hidden layer. So that, that's a mathematical theorem. This doesn't mean necessarily that we should always use neural networks with only one hidden layer, because the problem is they, this might not be an efficient representation, and it might be much smarter to have several hidden layers, because uh, even if you look at our image processing system in the, uh, in, the, in the brain, we know for a fact that the first layers do something like edge detection, and then they detect uh, which orientation the edges have, and so this is actually organized layer by layer. So it seems to be more efficient to do it this way. But at least in principle, you can produce arbitrary functions. Okay, and if you are out for a challenge for the homework, you can really try to um, implement um, a neural network that gives you a square, that only gives one inside a square, for example. And if that's not enough, uh, you can try to do uh, high values within an arbitrary convex shape. <laughs>
So let me just summarize this part. So this part ab was about still how powerful these neural networks are. And if I want to summarize what a neural network means in, in a nutshell, I would say it's a complicated nonlinear function that takes all these input values to the output values, and it depends on all the weights and biases. So if you want, I can write f of the input values, y in would be a vector, and this function also depends on parameters, and I will call them all together W. W stands for the weights, of course it should also include the biases. So it's just a function with many parameters, and that will give me uh, the output values of the neural network. Okay, so that's a neural network for us. Now we come back to the question, um, how do we actually choose the weights and the biases? And the answer will be with training, by training with thousands of examples. And if you think about it, this is actually something like curve fitting. Because um, in the one-dimensional case, I can most easily draw this, uh, you always have input-output pairs. One input value and the corresponding output value. So if you draw them for this simple one-dimensional case, uh, you would plot data points here and here and here and here and here. Each of these points would correspond to one training example. And what you want is, of course, you want a neural network that produces a smooth curve that goes through all these data points as closely as possible. It may not be able to do this to arbitrary precision because maybe there are not sufficiently many neurons in the neural network to, to give you the perfect match, but it should do this as well as possible. And this curve that is the neural network output depends on all these parameters W, and you want to adjust these parameters W in order to make the match as close as possible. And if you think about it, this is of course curve fitting. Yeah? So you could have tried the same maybe to fit a Lorentzian function to some spectrum, and then it would have two or three parameters, and you would try to figure out what are the best parameters to make the deviation as small as possible. The difference here is of course that we are curve fitting with a million of parameters because there are so many weights in this network. As a typical example, we could say maybe we have thousands of input neurons because the input might be a picture. Uh, we might have thousands of hidden layer neurons. And if they are at least if they are all to all connected, you will have weight matrices of dimensions of the type 1000 by 1000. So you literally have a million entries in such a weight matrix. So you really have a nonlinear function that has a million parameters, and the question is how do you adapt these parameters in a smart way? So the first thing you understand is, of course, if you want to successfully fit a function that has so many parameters, you also need many data points. It would be quite uh, silly to have only three data points and have a function with a million parameters, <laughs> then obviously you can usually make it work such that the function precisely goes through these three data points, but then you don't learn anything from this. So you really also need a lot of data points. And so how do we do this? How do we train, how do we update the weights in our network? And I want to show this in this example. Here we have such a network uh, which, has, which we have used to calculate the output for this particular set of input values that I depict here. So these are the input values in my network. Then I do one step to the next layer. I already calculated the outputs according to our usual formula, linear superposition and nonlinear function. And then I did this for the next layer and for the last layer. And finally, I got these two output values and these would be that the user wants to have. But now maybe these output values, they are not quite the good ones. Maybe for this particular set of input values, I would have expected a different output. So what I can do is I can try to change my weights a little bit, so to change the connection strengths. So for example, I change this weight. The question is what happens? What happens if I change this particular connection? Well, the first consequence will be that this 0.7 starts to change because this neuron receives input from that neuron down here according to this weight. If the weight changes, then also the 0.7 value will change. So let me say it changes to 0.8, for example. 
Now this change in turn will generate further changes down the line because you know that, for example, this 0.5 is also calculated from the 0.8. So if this value here has changed, the 0.5 itself will change. And so there are changes in the higher layer and this goes on until the output is reached. So you see a single change somewhere in the whole network of a single weight parameter proliferates up to the top, yeah? which may be good b because that's maybe what I need because maybe this output was not quite what I expected and maybe this little change in the weight parameter can push it more in the correct direction. Yeah? So this is the overall goal of training. I want to adapt all my weights such that the output for a given input comes a little bit closer uh, to the correct output that I wanted to have during training. And the hope is that if I do this often enough on many, many training examples, I will converge to a set of weights that do the curve fitting as well as possible. Okay, so this um, gives us already an idea and goes in the right direction, but of course this is not yet a mathematical procedure. I mean, this sounds a little bit like trial and error as if I want to change the weights a little bit and see what happens, yeah? So that would be terribly inefficient. Okay, just a brief, uh, brief um, uh, layout of the, uh, what we did so far. We uh, talked about the structure of the neural net. We talked, uh, we will now talk about the stochastic gradient descent. That is the method to uh, adapt the weights and then we will come to a very efficient way to evaluate this that will be called back propagation. And even though what I say now is a little bit technical, of course, it's somehow at the heart of all the neural networks, so it's worthwhile to at least once in your life see it for yourselves and to implement it yourself. And then later, of course, I will tell you that you actually don't have to do this <laughs> because by now, uh, since this is a known algorithm, people have implemented it and you can access it in very convenient frameworks and use it. But at least you should know it once, otherwise it's a little bit silly if you are just the blind user of some frame frameworks. Okay, and after that it's all smooth sailing. This is what this picture <laughs> is to represent. Okay. So again, so this is uh, our neural network with a structure that we already discussed. And um, here's what the neural network makes out of a given input. And this is what we would like, namely we have some target function uh, maybe defined by the training examples or def defined by some underlying physical process uh, that takes the input values to some true output values. And so we would like that our neural network approximates this target function as well as possible. So how can we make this a little bit more quantitative? Well, if you have ever done curve fitting, since the times of Gauss, so to speak, curve fitting is done in the following way. You look at all the data points that your curve should go through. For each of the data points, you realize that it doesn't quite go through that data point. There's an error, there's a deviation. You take all these deviations, you square them and you sum them, and that gives you a measure of the overall deviation from the true curve. Yeah? So that's a quadratic deviation. And so we want to do simply exactly the same here for our neural network. So what we take is the deviation, that is the difference, between what our neural network outputs for a given input and what we should have as output for a given input. We take the difference between the two, between the neural network and the correct value, and we take the square of this difference. If the output is no longer a number but a vector, then this should be interpreted as the uh, Pythagoreus Pythagoras norm uh, of the vector. So. so we take the square of this deviation and then we don't just want to calculate the deviation for this particular input, but we want to calculate it somehow for all possible inputs. So we want to average this quadratic deviation over all possible inputs that might be defined by your set of a million training examples or maybe even uh, there's an infinite space of inputs and maybe this uh, averaging over all possible inputs is only defined in a more abstract way because you can never actually carry it out or maybe you can carry it out analytically. But in any case, uh, this is what I define as the cost function. So it's a single number that I get out by averaging the quadratic deviation over all input samples. And I want to make this number as small as possible. So this number therefore is called the cost function. If it's large, it's bad. If it's small, it's good. 
Okay. Now this cost function no longer depends on the input sample because I've averaged over all possible input samples. However, it still obviously depends on these parameters W, on the weights of my neural network. Because if I choose different parameters, the answers that my neural network gives here will be different. Therefore, hopefully the deviation will be smaller and the cost function will be smaller. And so our task will now be to minimize this cost function, to find the set of weights W that will minimize my cost function. And that then defines the best fit that I can achieve with my network. Okay. So is this clear? That's very important, yeah, because that defines the whole game, basically. Whenever you want to apply a neural network, you want to tell me what should have been the correct answer and how do I punish the deviation from the correct answer. Here you take the square deviation. There are other cases which we will get to know where maybe you have a different cost function defined slightly differently, but you always somehow want to punish the deviation from the true answer. Okay. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, so good question. So the question was why do we have a one half in front of it? There's no very deep meaning. I just wanted to make my uh, formulas in the following simpler because, you know, if I take now the derivative, the two from the square will cancel the one half. So no particular meaning. And uh, if you use some framework or so and you say I want the square deviation, probably there's not even a one half there. Okay, any more questions? So let's go and try to minimize this cost function. Um, let's first ask uh, how would this look like if I only have a limited small number of samples because then I can literally uh, understand what's going on. If I only have um, n samples, then this average over all samples would just be 1 over n times the sum over n over all these samples. The upper index now uh, represents the sample number. And um, these could be my data points, the training examples. The deviations would be this red um, bars. And I just sum over the squares of these bars. Okay. So minimizing the cost function for this case is really just a case of uh, what people would call least squares fitting. But if we want to mm, discuss the general case, uh, maybe even with more parameters and more samples, um, how do we get the correct weights? Well, we want to minimize a function. As physicists, we know that um, if a function were to represent a potential, and I want to go to the minimum of this potential, then maybe my particle should slide down the potential. What does it mean to slide down the potential? Well, I should calculate the gradient of my potential. And if I want to go down, I should take the negative gradient. And then my particle should move along this negative gradient. Now here, I have a little bit an abstract particle to deal with. Uh, the coordinates of this abstract particle are actually is this high dimensional vector W that contains all the million <laughs> weights in my neural network. So it's a particle in one million dimensions. But still, I can slide down the negative uh, gradient of my cost function, and then that should mean that my particle slides down until it stops because it happens to lie in a minimum. So this is how I would go down the minimum. And for a physicist, that would correspond to the motion of actually an overdamped particle. So it's uh, a particle with a lot of friction where the velocity is proportional to the force instead of the acceleration proportional to the force. Okay. Good. So now we already know this could be a potential method that works. Calculate the cost function as a function of W, take the gradient, go down the negative gradient, and stop when it doesn't move anymore. The problem is that it really doesn't work in practice like this because we have this average over all possible training samples, and maybe there are millions of them, maybe even in principle infinitely many. So uh, we cannot really do this. And the solution is, however, uh, that you do a stochastic sampling. So if you want to take an average over 60 million people, maybe it's enough if you take a sample of a thousand people and then take the average. Yeah? And so the same happens here. We take a small batch of samples, 
and we calculate the gradient of the cost function only for the small batch of samples, um, and then we hope that this is already a good approximation. So in the following few slides, in order to distinguish my approximate version of the cost function from the true cost function, that is average over all training samples, I will put always a little C tilde. So C tilde is an approximate version, a stochastic sample of the true cost function. Okay. And then I would take the gradient of this with respect to the parameters W. I take the negative gradient, so there's the minus sign, and I add this to the old value W with some factor in front. That tells me how large is the step size. Yeah? If I want to have small step sizes, I make this factor very small. It's um, often called the learning rate uh, in programs. So that tells me how large will be the steps. Now, how does this look like, or why might it work even though we don't take an average literally over all samples? So I tried to visualize things here. So imagine I plot the true cost function C, that is the one that is formally averaged over all possible samples, and I plot its values in the space of weights. Now, of course, this is a one million dimensional space, I cannot plot it, but I imagine that I only, I keep all the weights constant except for two, W1 and W2, and so I have a two dimensional space now, and I can plot the values of C in this space, and if the values are smaller, I pl plot them in darker colors, so that's how re I represent my cost function. And what I want to do now is I want to slide down the hill. So I want to go from the large values, the bright colors up here, I want to go down to the small values, the darkish colors. And if I were able to calculate the gradient of the full cost function, say in this point, it should be a vector that points actually perpendicular to the contour lines of constant C. That's what you learned. The gradient always is perpendicular to the contour lines. So that would be the true gradient. This is the one that I want. In reality, we are sampling the cost function over a batch of 100 or 1,000 training samples. And so the gradient we get might be this red direction and it might even point in somehow the wrong direction sometimes. It fluctuates because it's just a stochastic sample. However, the funny thing is, if I only take small steps each time I sample, then if I don't move too far and I have now taken 10 steps, then I've moved on average in a direction that I would have obtained if instead of having only a thousand training samples per step, I had actually 10,000 samples because I'm sort of averaging over more and more samples as I proceed. Yeah? Um, so the overall direction I'm going into becomes an ever better approximation of the true gradient because by taking all these small steps, each of which already has thousand independent training samples, I effectively average over more. So that's the secret behind stochastic grade, what is called stochastic gradient descent. So you always take small samples, but you also take small steps, and uh, effectively you are averaging over uh, more and more samples. Okay. So if you believe uh, that for a moment, and you can also try this out for yourself, uh, maybe in a numerical experiment, let's believe that for a moment that this stochastic sampling is okay. That still leaves the problem how do we actually calculate efficiently the gradient, even, even for such a small uh, uh, amount of samples? Yeah? You see, the problem is that we have this one million different weights in our neural network. So this gradient vector, C is a scalar function, but we take the gradient with respect to all the components of this weight vector. So um, the result, the gradient, will be actually a one million dimensional vector, you, you have to realize. And so how to calculate this efficiently? And literally, in the beginnings of neural networks, say 60s, 70s, people were doing numerical differentiation, which is a terrible idea, actually, here. So numerical differentiation means, well, you can calculate, in principle, the cost function, or the you can calculate the output for a given training example. From that, you can calculate the cost function. Maybe you have several training examples, so you calculate one value of the cost function. Then you start to change one of the weights a little bit, 
So for example, this weight you replace by its old value plus some small epsilon, and you observe how the output changes and therefore how the cost function changes. Okay, so that gives you actually the derivative of the cost function with respect to this one weight. But then you have to do this again and again because you also want to know the derivatives with respect to all the other weights for all the connections that you have here. So you would end up evaluating your network a million times if you have a million weights. And that uh, takes a long time actually. So this is a terrible idea. But in high school you learned that there is a thing called the chain rule. And that actually will save us a lot of work that will boil down the one million evaluations to a single evaluation. So if you have a large network, it gives you a million fold advantage. Yeah. So what does the chain rule here mean? Well, let's start small. Let's take the simplest possible, or a very simple network, two input neurons, one output neuron. Um, let's just try to do this derivative by hand. And then we start to see a pattern and then we can go on. Okay. So here you see the linear part of our calculation, taking the input values, multiplying by the weights, adding it up. And uh, then we stick this result into our nonlinear function and what we get, f of z, is already the output for this simple case. Okay? And now we take, as we said, in order to calculate the cost function, we take the difference between this network output and the desired output, which I here call capital F. So capital F depends on y1, comma y2, maybe any arbitrary function that you want to train on. Um, so we take the uh, difference here, we take the square, and then we average over all possible training samples, so all possible combinations of one y1 and y2. Okay? And the result is our cost function. Depends on w. Okay. Now I can just go ahead and take the gradient, take the derivative. So let's do this. I take the derivative of C with respect to, say, W1, which would be the weight of this particular connection. Well, I have to take the derivative uh, inside the averaging brackets, which is completely allowed because this average does not depend on the weights. It's just an average over uh, training samples, over inputs. And then, well, I had have to take the derivative of the square. So what does this give me? Uh, the deri derivative of a square is two times uh, the argument of the square times chain rule, uh, the derivative of what was inside the square. So here I have f of z minus f. This is just uh, coming from the derivative of the square times what was inside. And I only have to take the derivative of the part that, dependent or that depended on w, and that's the network. So the desired output function, that's of course not depending on the weights. Yeah, That's something external that's used for training. Uh, but the neural network, that does uh, depend on W. So here, um, again, I have to apply the chain rule. I first take the derivative of uh, F with respect to its argument Z. And then I take the derivative of Z with re respect to W. Yeah. So just repeated application of the chain rule. And now the derivative of z with respect to w1, well, you read it off here, it's just linear in w1, so it just would give me y1. So it's not difficult anymore. Okay. So at this point, you do not yet see, of course, the pattern, but you see that in principle it's not so many complicated steps. It's just repeatedly applying the chain rule, starting from the cost function and then seeing that you also have to take the derivatives through these uh, nonlinear functions. Okay, let's see how this works um, in a full network. Now, if I want to do it for a full network, I just have to be a little bit more careful with my notation, obviously. So, the network is composed out of layers, so I need one index that counts which layer I am in. And within each layer, I still need another index that tells me which neuron I am at. So uh, the upper index in brackets, that will be the layer index. The lower index will be uh, the number of the neuron inside the layer. And so the y's are always the values of the neurons, but remember they are calculated by taking a nonlinear function of another value which we call z. So the z's are always these linear superpositions that we talked about. 
So that's the Z is the input value for taking Y equals F of Z. Okay. So otherwise it has the same way of treating the indices. And then finally we have the weights. The weights are connecting uh, subsequent layers. So for the two layers N and N minus one, there will be a weights connecting them. And then there's J and K belonging uh, to N or N minus one respectively. So th they count which neurons are connected. Okay. Good. Um, for the moment, I will actually not talk about the biases B. Uh, you can treat them in a similar manner, but mm, that's a detail, so to speak, you know. Okay, so now I want to go through it uh, step by step, and in the end, we will know how it works for a general network. So, we have the cost function. That is actually an average over a cost function that is defined per input. So that would be the square of the deviation in the simplest case, but it could also be defined in a different way. In any case, for each possible input, we can calculate what would be the cost function. First, we calculate what's the network output, we calculate what's the true output, and somehow we measure the deviation. Okay. So now um, I want to take the derivative of this cost function with respect to some particular weight. So I always denote this by W star. This is one of the weights in the network. It may sit down at a very low layer, yeah? So it may not be directly connected to the output layers. So it is one of the weights in this big uh, set of connections. And now I assume I have this quadratic cost function, so um, I can write this out. There will be a sum over all the output neurons, and then in principle there was this difference squared, but since I took the derivative and there was this one-half strategically introduced, uh, I only get uh, this value, and then I have to apply the chain rule. So I have to take the derivative of the output neuron, Jn, uh, with respect to this weight W star. And now I remind myself that uh, y equals f of z. Again, I apply the chain rule, so I first have to take the derivative of f with respect to its argument. That gives me f prime of z. And then I take the derivative of z with respect to the weight. So it's actually the same thing that we just did, only keeping all the indices. Okay. Now, the object I will be really dealing with is this dz over dw in the following. And you will see that this is very a very convenient object to deal with in the following. So this was only the first step, going from the cost function in the first step to this derivative of z. But after that, so this is s the first step, it just has to be done. But after that, we will see there's a recursion, recursion relation. Okay. Because now I can try to apply the chain rule repeatedly. L let's see how this works. So. I want to take the derivative of z in layer n with respect to my weight. So what do I do? I ask myself, well, the z in layer n obviously depends on all the values of the neurons in one layer below. Huh? So I should uh, take the derivative with respect to all these values of the neurons in the layer below, n minus 1, and take the derivative of those with respect to w. That's just uh, the chain rule. Now, uh, Z expressed in terms of these values YK in the layer below, remember that was just the linear superposition of these values, W times the Y. So again, if I take the derivative with respect to the Y, I just retain the W, the weight. Yeah. So that's like before, only keeping the indices properly. And then... To take this derivative, remember y was something like f of z. So to take that derivative, again, just like before, I get f prime of z, so derivative of the nonlinear function f with respect to its argument. That was the argument. And then I have to take the derivative of that argument with respect to the weight. So this seemed a little bit cumbersome, maybe, but you see that now we are basically done because now I have an expression in the end that again has dz over dw, just like before. But before we were talking about layer n, now we're talking about layer n minus one. 
<laughs> and now I can just iteratively go down layer by layer. Yeah? So from now on, there will be nothing new. So this happens in each layer. Okay. And so um, I can write this even nicer if I look very closely at this expression and I look hard at the indices and I realize, well, there's a free index J on the left-hand side. There's an index K, but this is being summed over on the left on the right-hand side. And there's a free index J also there. So, so it matches. That's, first of all, nice. But the second thing is you can interpret this thing here as a matrix that has two indices, J and K. And this matrix with J and K is multiplied onto the components of a vector that has indices k. Yeah? So it's really a matrix vector multiplication. This is my point here. So all of this complicated chain rule thing led to a matrix vector multiplication. And so uh, I can uh, get this if I define my matrix elements as exactly what's written down here. Uh, and that depends on j and k. Yeah? It's a little bit funny matrix. It contains the um, derivatives of my nonlinear function and also the weights. And it's evaluated at the current uh, values of the neurons. So that means it depends actually on the input. Yes? It's not the same matrix every time. It changes. This matrix changes. But it's still a matrix and it's a matrix vector multiplication. Okay. And so now, if I do my recursive application of the chain rule, what it really means is in each step from one layer to the next down the set of layers, I have only a matrix vector multiplication. So in the end, I will have a repeated matrix multiplication. For each um, pair of layers, I will get multiplication by a matrix. And so in the end, I have something like this. So you know that this is how repeated matrix multiplication looks like. You have these matrices. You always sum over the inner index, so K here and K there. And there will be an L here and an L in the next M. So you just sum over the inner indices, and that's matrix multiplication, and that's it. Yeah? And we know, of course, how to perform matrix multiplication efficiently. And you don't need to do it yourself because the computer knows how to do it. OK. Um, so this is almost everything. So this is the most crucial point that um, repeated application of the chain rule gives you this very nice structure of repeated matrix multiplications that can be done very efficiently. But of course, at some point, this procedure has to stop because at some point, you will encounter the actual uh, layer to layer connection that has the weight with, which with respect to which you wanted to do the um, gradient. And so what happens then is actually also not very difficult. Um, if I want to take the derivative of z with respect to some weight that is actually contained in the expression of z explicitly, not just implicitly because it occurs indirectly in these values that z is composed of, but it explicitly occurs in this expression, then you remember that z was just a linear superposition of the previous layer values yk, and the weights were these, uh, well, the weights w. So if I take the derivative with respect to one of these weights that actually occur, then I ju just will get the value yk. Yeah. So that's simple. This last step is really simple. Um, and, well, if, it, if the W star really stood for a bias, then you just get a 1. So this is just a small technical detail. So I just wanted to say this uh, repeated application of the chain rule, at some point it stops. Um, so uh, let's summarize this. It was maybe a little bit many steps, but really we are now at the end. It's just a matter of summarizing it and seeing that it really uh, becomes a beautiful algorithm. So we started with a cost function. Uh, let's consider it for a particular training example. Let's take the derivative with respect to some weight which might be hidden somewhere down uh, in the network. And then in these first few steps, we just uh, got some not so complicated expression and it's multiplied by this dz over dw. Okay. And now it's this dz over dw which we want to evaluate and where I showed you how I can repeatedly apply the chain rule. Um, and then I can interpret this now as a vector, as we just said, which has an index j. 
and then I can go on with my repeated matrix multiplications. So um, um, to, to summarize this algorithm, which is called backpropagation, and I will tell you why in a moment, um, you would start by initializing a vector at the output layer. This uh, contains one part that comes from the cost function and this f prime of z that automatically occurs there if you take the derivative. So that's nothing special. It's just something you, you want to start with. And um, for each layer, you actually, so let me first maybe go there. For each layer, you multiply this so-called deviation vector that you started with, with a matrix that implements the derivative. Yeah? And so layer by layer, you have another matrix multiplication again and again and again. But also, in addition, for each layer, you recognize that uh, if your W star is equal to one of the weights that actually occur in this connection between the two layers that you're currently looking at, uh, then you can already finally evaluate the derivative of the cost function with respect to this W star. And if you go through the formulas, you will see it's this um, last derivative at this particular layer uh, times the deviation vector that you have constructed so far. So that's a summary of what happens in this algorithm. So what this means is you start at the top, you construct your deviation vector, you do these repeated matrix multiplications going down the network, and for each of these steps, you already get all the derivatives with respect to all the weights that were in this connection. Yeah? And you just store them somewhere. You didn't have to do anything else. It's one single pass from the top of the network to the bottom, and you end up with all the one million different gradients with respect to all the possible values of W star that you could imagine. Yeah? You don't do this repeatedly for different W star. You already collect all the... All the, all the different results. Yeah. And so this is called backpropagation because actually it's a little bit like the forward propagation through the network only in reverse. So in the forward pass, which allows us to calculate the output, we start with the input layer, we calculate these values, we calculate the values one higher up until we reach the output layer, and this is then the output of the network. In backpropagation, we start at the output we calculate essentially what's the deviation from the true desired output, and then this gives us a vector, and then we propagate this back through the network down to the lowest layer, and that tells us how we should adapt our weights. Now, when you see it for the first time, maybe still there are a little bit too many indices here, <laughs> so you have to sit down and slowly go through it and convince yourself that this is actually correct. But um, if you accept that, uh, I hopefully didn't do a mistake in any of the indices, if you accept this, accept this algorithm, you realize how powerful it is. Because I told you, if I wanted to do it by numerical differentiation and I have a 1 million weights, I would have to calculate the cost function for taking 1 million different steps. So for each of the weights, I would adjust it a little bit, calculate the new value, take the difference to the old value, see what happens, whether the cost function reduces or increases, and that would give me the gradient of the cost function with respect to all the one million weights. Here it becomes much, much more efficient. I do just one backward pass and that's it. So instead of having one million forward passes, I have one single backward pass. So that's hugely more efficient. Yes, please. Yeah, so, um, so there's the question, do I do this for all training samples? The answer is yes. So um, for a given training sample, I would get this deviation vector, and then I go down through the network again. I get one contribution towards my gradient. Then I do it for the next training samples and the maybe the next 100 training examples out of my batch, and then I take the average over all of these gradients. So that gives me the small average over a small batch, and then I take a step in my weight update in my training. And then I do, the uh, do it again for a completely different set of 100 training examples. Yes. And uh, needless to say, when you really implement it on the computer, um, in addition to all the indices that we are already carrying around, you would carry around another 
index that corresponds to the samples in the batch. So that would run from 0 to 99 if you have a batch of 100 samples. And that means that, again, you don't do a for loop going through all the 100 training examples, always doing this thing, but you actually do it only once. And in the if you look at the program, maybe you wouldn't even notice that it's doing this 100 times in parallel because it doesn't even become obvious in the notation. Hmm. OK, yeah, there's a question. Uh, you mean when I uh, talk about the cost function? Uh, yeah, so it's a little bit nicer, of course, if I take the average because um, otherwise I couldn't compare easily the cost functions that I evaluate for smaller batch size and larger batch size, so it's, it's really nicer if I talk about averages. Okay, any more questions? So this is, of course, a mathematic set of mathematical steps that you should walk through uh, at home. Uh, but once you accept the end result, uh, at least you can accept that this is really a powerful method. Okay, so this is what I already said. It's very efficient, uh, only one pass through the network, no more effort than forward propagation, and a million-fold advantage over the naive way of doing things. Okay. And uh, maybe if you are physicists, it helps you to get a more intuitive picture. And here's one that I can offer. Um, what you wanted to have is the output maybe is not quite what you would like it to be. And so you would want to pull the output in the correct direction a little bit. And um, the way I imagine it is now, there's a force pulling at the output neurons and then this force propagates down the network and also adjusts all the weights a little bit. And this is what happens when you take this deviation vector at the output that is actually uh, proportional to the direction in which you want to go, and then you propagate it back down the network. It tells you how you should adjust the weights a little bit. Okay. So I, I guess this slide is just as a summary. Um, what happens in each layer, uh, how you update uh, the weights and the biases. Um, this is more for reference. Mm. So now if you want to really implement this, maybe it's nice to see how it's, how it's really done. Um, uh, I already told you that really we want to keep full batches. So the Y for a given layer uh, is actually of dimensions batch size times the number of neurons in this layer. Um, the delta, the deviation vector, always has the dimension, again, batch size times the number of neurons in this particular layer that we are currently visiting, but it will change as we go down the layers. And then we have the weights and the biases, uh, which have the appropriate uh, dimensions. Um, okay. So this is the this is the important step uh, where we actually take the deviation vector and multiply it by the weight matrix uh, in the right way, and then also multiply it by the f prime of z, uh, which you remember was part of this uh, matrix uh, that we have to multiply with. So this is shown here again. So translating this expression that has a lot of indices carefully and correctly into Python you end up uh, with this expression. Um, it's beautiful on the one hand because it doesn't display all the indices. On the other hand, you have to think a little bit <laughs> which are the dimensions and what really goes on here. And so whenever I forget, I just take the simple examples and try to implement this and then I will see what's the shape of the resulting matrix. Okay. So, um, well, if you wanted to implement it, uh, just to be very concrete, uh, you would store all the weights, which are, remember, matrices of different dimensions, depending on the layer. You would store them in a list in Python. A list can hold uh, different objects, even matrices of different dimensions. Uh, so that's perfectly fine. And the same for the biases and for the values y in the layers and so on. So now let's jump to the full algorithm. Um, 
the point here is just to show you that the full algorithm for having a full arbitrary neural network, both forward propagation and backward propagation, uh, basically uh, fi fits on two slides. So that's the that's the that's the message here. Uh, you can find these slides also on on the web, and we have a link to the code. Um, but um, this is what I need to calculate uh, both the nonlinear function and its derivative. So I give back both of these values simultaneously. That makes it more efficient later. Uh, this is one forward step through the network. Given the old values y in the previous layer and w and b, I calculate first my linear step and then I apply my uh, nonlinear function. And now here is my function that actually runs the full network. So I will put into the function the values of the input neurons as a vector, or more precisely as a matrix, because I carry it along the batch. Um, then I start at the lowest layer, and I range through all the layers from lowest to top, and I store all the values, and then finally, I return the highest value. But why do I store all the values? Well, that normally would not be needed, but I will need it for the back propagation. Remember, the back propagation depends on things like f prime of z at the corresponding layer, and these are the z's that I have calculated before during the forward propagation. So that's why I store all these values here. So for example, f prime of z is stored, and the um, actual values y in the layer are stored. So while doing the forward propagation, I already anticipate that later I will have to do the backward propagation and I will reuse these values, so that that's why I store them. Well, and then there's the back propagation. So there's the one important uh, step that I told you about where I have the deviation vector and I multiply by the weight matrix and by these f prime of z. So that's the matrix vector multiplication that is there in each step. And then here's the back propagation. So I tell my algorithm what would have been the target, yeah, what would have been the correct value. I calculate the deviation vector delta, which is essentially the difference between the correct value, the target, and the actual output. So remember in Python, if I have as index minus one, it just means the last index of a list. So that's the highest layer for me. And then I go through the various steps. I range uh, through all the layers, and I don't want to go through the details here, but I just apply the different steps of the backpropagation algorithm, and then that's it. Yeah? So I collect all the all the gradients, so this is shown here, dw layer, and then here's the number of the layer, that will finally store the gradient of my cost function for this particular training example uh, with respect to the weights of this layer. Yeah? So this um, dw of layer actually has the same dimensions as the weights w in this layer, so some matrix. Okay. And this is enough. Then I can use the results of this to do a little stochastic gradient descent step. Okay, so maybe we can discuss the homework later, or, or uh, I'll tell you later about it. Um, let me just uh, uh, go here to the summary. So we claim that we have now understood or at least seen for the first time how back propagation works both forward propagation and back propagation and this is really this was the hardest part so to speak of this lecture <laughs> um, of this lecture series so uh, once you know how forward propagation and back propagation work you can start training your arbitrary neural networks This is maybe another graphical way of uh, explaining back propagation once more. Um, so this is the deviation vector, uh, the actual output minus the target output. Then I, whenever I hit a neuron, I have to calculate an f prime. Whenever I um, have a connection, I have, mul have to multiply by the weight of this connection. And so in this way, I can now go down the network and finally 
I hit the actual connection with respect to which I wanted to calculate the gradient. And so the what we had displayed in terms of this repeated matrix multiplication where I have to sum over all these indices, this would still have to be done here. So in a physics language, or if you know quantum physics and Feynman parts, uh, you would say um, the prescription I gave here uh, multiplying this f prime and w and f prime and w, this is only one contribution and I should sum over all possible paths through this network in order to get the full contribution. This is of course by far not the efficient way of doing things. The efficient way is what we just learned, the matrix vector multiplication, but this is a nice way of visualizing it. So when you want to calculate the gradient with respect to some weight down here, you just need to connect the output to this weight down here and uh, the prescription is whenever you pass through a neuron, you take f prime of z for this neuron. Whenever you pass through a connection, you, uh, you multiply by w for this connection. Okay. Yes? Uh, so the biases I tended to sweep under the rug a little bit, but if you pay close attention to what I'm doing, I actually keep those biases. Um, they are always treated slightly differently. So, um, for example here, if you take Z and take the derivative with respect to one of the Ws, then you get Y, the corresponding Y. If you take the derivative with respect to the bias, you just get one, so it's even simpler. Um, and correspondingly, if you then finally hit the, the correct uh, row, um, and you take the derivative of C with respect to W, you have to multiply the deviation vector with the Y values in this row. Uh, for the bias, it's even simpler. You just keep the deviation vector. And so this uh, actually went through all these algorithms. Let me see whether I find it again. So for example, here, um, instead of just storing also the, uh, the gradient with respect to the weights, which I call DW, I also uh, calculated the gradient with respect to the biases db and it looks, the expression if you look at it carefully, it looks almost the same, only a little bit simpler. So you just, um, it's somehow analogous to the weights. Okay. So this is the summary we already had. And this is what I just said. So if you, if you already know your quantum mechanics, you know that if you want to um, propagate the wave function of a particle in time, then, well, one way to do this is just to solve the time-dependent Schrödinger equation. Yeah? But another way of doing it is to say, well, my wave function at time t, I obtained from my wave function at time zero by multiplying by the time evolution operator, u of t, that propagates a large time interval t. And now I can split this ti big time evolution into a lot of small time steps. And I might even need this. Maybe I have a time-dependent problem where I apply a time-dependent force, and so during each time step, the force is different, so the unitary looks different, yeah? And so the each of these unitaries actually con connects one time slice here with the next time slice there. So it evolves the wave function from this time to that time. The time is running downwards for me, yeah? And so what you end up with is either this repeated application of unitaries or if you really write out the repeated matrix multiplication, you can interpret this as meaning, well, um, I should draw all the possible paths going from the initial position to the final position at which I want to evaluate my wave function at the final time. Not only this path, but all the other possible paths and then I should sum or integrate over all possible trajectories, and that really implements this, um, that really implements this um, repeated uh, matrix vector multiplication. So that's what's called the si uh, Feynman sum over paths, or the path integral, actually. And what I just showed you is that the structure of back propagation is actually very similar. So only 30 lines of code and you can start doing your neural networks only with Python, yeah? No framework that you need to download, just using Python. Yeah, please, there was a question. Yeah. 
um, is there a way to vectorize the for loop over the layers? I fear not, at least not obvious to me, because the different layers have very different dimensions, and so I cannot uh, simply say, oh, this is just one giant matrix vector product, because um, all of these weights are matrices of different dimensions. So I fear that I don't have a have a better way of doing this. Okay. So let's summarize so far. Um, we have learned this general purpose algorithm that we will apply in the following. We can produce the output of a neural network by feed forward, and we can produce the gradients that we need for training by back propagation. Uh, that doesn't mean that now you're done and you can solve any problem with the same piece of code because there are still some choices that you have to make that may be problem specific. So the first obvious choice is the network layout. So how many layers do I want to have? How many neurons do I want to have in each of these layers? Uh, maybe also what is the type of the nonlinear function that I choose? Um, maybe my layers are even connected in a slightly non-standard way. So these are choices that you have to make. And such choices are such choices usually go by the name of hyperparameters. So hyperparameters are not the values of the weights or so, these are found by training, but the hyperparameters are the things that you decide and that you put in, and maybe you try around a little bit for your specific problem, whether a small network already gives nice results or whether you have to go to a larger network and so on. Um, then the next very important step is obviously to generate the training examples. We haven't really talked about that so far, but that's really important, and actually, since all these modern frameworks already implement all the backpropagation and so on for you, this is the part where you have to invest most of the work. Um, it depends on the application. Uh, it might mean you have a large database where you have already correct examples, maybe images together with the correct label. So then they have been stored on disk, and you just use this database, and you draw random samples from this database. Or maybe you produce your training samples by software. This happens often in physics. So for example, in physics, I do a simulation um, that gives me the correct, I don't know, energy of a molecule. And then I do a similar simulation for a different molecule again and again and again. And then I want to train my uh, neural network on these examples. And then finally, uh, you want to do the actual training and again, there are a few choices that you can make. For example, remember the step size or the learning rate, how fast you want to go down your stochastic gradient. That's an important choice. Also, later we will learn there are a few more efficient uh, routines than just the simple stochastic gradient descent that can accelerate your training. And again, you want to choose which of these techniques uh, to use. Or you would choose things such as the batch size, for example. Too large batch size may be problematic, too small batch size might also be problematic, and we will discuss this in the following. Okay. So um, I now want to go through one example, and this example, well, if we still have time for this, and let's see. This example uh, works like this. Uh, it works like the neural network that we had in the beginning where we just produce a random image, but now we want to produce a particular image. So we want to train this function to produce a particular image. So the input again will be two values corresponding to the two coordinates in two dimensional space. And the output will be val one value corresponding to the color of the image at this particular point. And so um, what I want to do now is to basically um, take a picture um, that represents my target function. Then I will sample random pixels, random coordinates in this picture. I will extract from the image what should be the correct color value, and I want to train my neural network on that. Mm -hmm. 